Okay, I'd like to welcome Cheryl Hall Russell, Executive Director of Hill House Association to the stage to welcome all of you to Hill House. What a nice full room. Uh, welcome to the Hill House Association and the Elsie Hillman Auditorium. And I think it is uh, really good that this particular conversation is happening, happening here in this lead silver building uh, that was renovated back in 2010. Um, it talks about, it, it reflects our emphasis on, on green and, and how we feel about uh, sustainability. And so I'm glad that we are, are about to be engaged in some really good conversation on this and I'm glad you're here. One little plug for the Hill District before you go. Um, tis the season to, to do your shopping. I hope you come back and, and go out on Center Avenue, use our grocery store, go to the Ujima Collective where they've got really interesting gifts that you could share. This is a place not only for you to meet, and we always welcome you here, but we want you to be a part of the overall Hill District. And so welcome not only here, but to the Hill District, and I hope this is a fantastic meeting. Thanks for hosting us for the Inspire Speaker Series, Cheryl. We really enjoy being here. So I wanted to welcome you tonight um, to the Inspire Speaker Series, uh, envisioning a sustainable and collaborative and inclusive economy um, with Jeremy Rifkin um, and Bill Jenneret. Um, some of you may have picked up these as you came in. Um, we'd like you to think about and write down um, what you've been inspired to do um, after um, this event, um, and we're going to take those and, and make a nice graphic um, to summarize sort of what you all are taking away um, from the Inspire Speakers series, because we find it very important uh, to bring national speakers locally and pair them with local people and sort of seed interesting um, and innovative ideas with you, but we hope that, you know, we don't just all sit in a room <laughs> once a month and, and absorb great knowledge, but we actually go out into our communities and apply that um, to create more sustainable places. Um, so thank you for coming to the Inspire Speakers series. I'm Aurora Sherrard. I'm Executive Director and Vice President of Innovation for Green Building Alliance. Thank you. <laughs> um, we present the Inspire Speaker Series to you in partnership um, with P4, People, Planet, Place, and Performance, uh, which I hope you'll be hearing a lot more about um, in the next year as some measures and metrics um, come through uh, that program. Um, and we'd also like you to go and visit our new Inspire Speaker Series website, um, inspirespeakerseries.com and .org. Um, we have information on the past three seasons and this current fourth season of the Inspire Speaker Series, including some videos. We'll be uploading podcasts and all sorts of fun information of all the speakers you've been able to enjoy over the past four years. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for this event specifically, uh, FedEx and Fourth Economy and also um, our presenting partners and funders. Um, I'm gonna read these folks because they are very important to us. Uh, Chatham University, the Environmental Charter School, uh, Forbo, the Heinz Endowments, Hill House Association, Homewood Children's Village, the Green and Healthy Schools Academy, the Laurel Foundation, Pittsburgh Schweitzer Fellows, Repair the World, Sustainable Pittsburgh, and Urban Innovation 21. All of these partners uh, help us bring people to these events and ensure that we're reaching out um, into a diverse set of communities throughout Pittsburgh to ensure that everybody has an opportunity to be inspired. Also to our media sponsors, uh, 90.5 WESA, um, which I heard an ad <laughs> the other morning <laughs> at about uh, on my drive time um, into the office, and WIEP as well as Next Pittsburgh. And GBA is a membership organization. We're actually having a membership drive right now. So if you're not a GBA member um, or you'd like to renew, you can be eligible for wonderful, wonderful prizes, um, including um, a dinner um, with me and my husband, um, who is a chef. <laughs> and so Jesse, who works for the food bank, will actually buy food. We'll come to your house or you can come to ours. Um, and we'll eat and drink and, and make merry. Um, so renew your GBA membership. <laughs> Um, and I also wanted to remind you um, that the Inspire Speaker Series will go on hiatus um, in January, um, but we'll be back in February, despite the cold, with a storytelling session. Um, and so we'll be sending up, in, as we follow up from this, um, some more information about this session. But we are looking for storytellers. Um, and so those of you who follow GB on a national stage may know that we've done a storytelling session at Green Build, which is the International Green Building Conference, for two years running. Um, and we realized 
realized we've never done this locally. Um, so we're, being, we're, we're giving up the stage to you. We want you to tell your story um, about creating a sustainable, vibrant, healthy, and just region. Um, so let us know if you want to be a storyteller. And so I'd like to uh, introduce our local speaker tonight, uh, William Generet Jr. Um, he's the president and CEO of Urban Innovation 21. Um, Bill actually is a Pittsburgher born and bred. Um, and he left in 1989 after the collapse of the steel industry when he was 18. Um, it, it wasn't a conducive place for him at the time. There were no jobs, um, no type of future, let alone a sustainable one. So he left for college and he thought at the time that he wasn't coming back. Um, and as Pittsburgh changed and evolved, so did Bill's vision of what Pittsburgh could be and Pittsburgh's own uh, vision of what it could be changed at the same time. And so um, being a good Pittsburgh boomeranger, um, <laughs> Bill came back and we're tremendously glad that he did. In the past eight years um, at Urban Innovation 21, he's really been looking at applying the innovation economy in underserved communities and I'm happy to turn over the stage to him tonight so he can tell you all about the great work that he's been doing. Bill Generet. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Before we get started, I just want to paint a little picture, uh, but I want to get a little information. Uh, how many of you are from Pittsburgh or were here through the 70s, 80s, 90s? Okay. Pretty good number. Pretty good number. Um, I was here. I was born in 1971, so I remember the boom. I remember all the communities that were doing well. Uh, and I remember sort of the power of uh, steel. Uh, but I was also here when we lost uh, 160,000 jobs and we lost 300,000 people. And for me, uh, those aren't statistics, it's personal. Anybody who was here during that time knew somebody, family member, friend, uh, parents of friends, who were impacted by that. Uh, people lost jobs, lost jobs in droves. Uh, my godfather uh, lost his job, uh, the man who raised me uh, while my parents were both getting their graduate degree. Uh, hard working, worked in the steel industry, lost his job, could never find another one. And uh, with that too, lost his soul. And so um, that's what motivates me. That's what motivates me. And so I left in 1989 and uh, see one of my good friends here, Morris Turner, who also left with me. Pretty much anybody who has the opportunity to leave, left. And we all said, you know what? We're not coming back. We're not coming back. And it was interesting. I would always come back to visit because my, my family was here. Uh, but I was living in D.C. at the time. And uh, I was living in D.C. during September 11th. I worked about a mile and a half from the Pentagon. And so it was my wife who said, um, we just had, a, had our, our first child, said, let's find a better place for us to, to raise our family. Do you ever think about Pittsburgh? And I was like, of course not. Never moved back to Pittsburgh. <laughs> but I came back, and I uh, looked at it through different lenses, and I was shocked at what had happened, what had occurred. Totally different city. Um, and so I was excited, excited, because it was really a public-private partnership, and it was a lot of work that created that. Uh, but I was also uh, dismayed because every single community, every single African American community uh, that played a role in my development uh, was not connected uh, to that economic transformation. And so, but, but we figured that it was a great place for us to be. And so we came back in 2004 and um, uh, started a company and then uh, sold that company but had the opportunity to work for a public private partnership that was started. Uh, it was the president of Duquesne, and it was the head of the Hill House Economic Development Corporation that came together with a lot of other partners and said, hey, we see this great stuff happening that's really beginning to take root. But uh, when we look outside of our window, there's no connection. And so this public-private partnership was formed, uh, four educational institutions, several foundations, the city, county, uh, state government. Uh, we were formed to really figure out how to connect the dots, and so that's the work that we're doing today. And we're doing this work under what's called an inclusive innovation model. Uh, that was a model that uh, really started in, in India, China, and uh, uh, has, has really uh, been adopted in Europe. And, 
And really the essence of it is that when you look at innovation, innovation policy, you have to make sure that its impacts are positive on all segments of society. And traditionally, that's not how we've looked at uh, innovation, innovation policy. So a public-private partnership started in 2007 with the explicit goal of uh, growing a region's innovation economy uh, because incredible work uh, was done and we're just trying to layer on some incentives to, to continue that work, but also to, to really make sure that we were connecting that growth to communities and people that uh, weren't connected to it. And so here's a list of uh, our public-private uh, partners and some of our our funders. And when I say public-private partnership, people often say, oh, what is that? Well, it means that people have a vested interest. And when I say vested interest, they're either putting in cash or they're providing uh, specific and quantifiable in-kind services. So it makes things a little bit more serious. So like I said, um, Pittsburgh was doing great. It was what brought us back. Um, and I really saw the potential for us to continue with the momentum because, again, we can't express enough about how bad Pittsburgh was. I mean, the bottom dropped out. Um, but uh, although we've done well, we still have uh, some serious issues. Uh, according to a study that was done by the Pittsburgh Foundation, about 30% of Pittsburgh residents are not connected and have the potential to not be connected to the region's uh, economic transformation and prosperity. Pittsburgh, and also, and this is something that I'm embarrassed about, uh, has the highest poverty rate uh, uh, for African American adults of any major US city. So what we see is we see uh, uh, two worlds. So one of our goals uh, through our work is to make sure that the, the, the development that occurs um, through uh, uh, innovation-based economic development is a uh, development that positively benefits uh, the residents. And so we run a, a place-based program called the Pittsburgh Central Keystone Innovation Zone. There are about 29 innovation zones in the state. Um, ours was the only one to really have an express mission of helping uh, innovation companies start up and grow outside of uh, the concentrated geography where they generally grow. And so we uh, run a tax credit program that companies, startup companies can uh, use to turn into cash. And so, uh, you know, since our inception, we've provided about $5.3 million in direct cash assistance to uh, companies. We have uh, small grants. We've provided about half a million dollars in uh, grants to uh, several of our uh, tech companies. And we have a great uh, internship program, which I'll tell you tell you about in more detail. And we've also uh, worked to raise a lot of money to help our partners that do and lead the groundwork for uh, community-based economic development. Um, and so we've supported over 100 companies, including uh, some of our region's most, uh, most successful, the Resumator, now called Jazz, uh, No Weight, All Point Systems. So there's a list of, um, of uh, just some of the companies that we've worked with and that we've helped uh, help grow. So our internship program, one of the benefits that we provide to our companies is interns. So we pay interns from Duquesne, Point Park, Carlo, and CCAC to work for the innovation companies, advanced manufacturing, tech, uh, with good jobs uh, at our health uh, healthcare system. Uh, with, uh, and uh, one of the things that we're excited about is that about 60% of the participants are women. So a lot of times when we look at the innovation economy and we look at uh, the disconnect, uh, there's a disconnect with women and so we've worked hard to bridge that gap. Uh, about 45% of our interns are uh, African American, uh, which uh, you generally don't see. And uh, really excited to do this, at least part of our internship work in conjunction with the Pittsburgh Promise. Uh, but some of our, our metrics, and one of the things I'm most excited about, is that about 60% of the participants uh, from CCAC that go through our internship program actually graduate and uh, uh, get their degree from CCAC, and about 40% go on to four universities, which is significantly higher than um, the, uh, the national average. And so the first stage of our work was to get these companies 
to uh, locate. And a lot of that took place in uh, the uptown uh, section of uh, the Greater Hill District community. So we have about 25, 30 companies that have located there and are growing there. And what we said is if we can connect the dots, connect Oakland and downtown and a lot of the growth that was taking place there and get those companies to locate, then we would see economic growth and economic development happen, or at least we would create the environment in conjunction with others to help make that happen. And so these are a few of the projects that, that we've worked on, one being the Energy Innovation Center. Um, it was very important for us that that not be a research park that was disconnected from the community. So we worked very hard with Pittsburgh Gateways and continue to work with them uh, to make sure that uh, the residents of the community benefit. Um, uh, Shop and Save, we uh, did some of, the, some of the initial groundwork for that. Uh, Cheryl Hall Russell left. Uh, she uh, did a Herculean job to, to take that over uh, the goal line. Uh, Start Uptown. You know, um, it's our city's first organic community-based accelerator. And um, we purposely used our incentives to get companies to locate there. So we're really seeing uh, some growth taking place. So uh, in about 2012, we had a great conversation with the community because we're always looking to improve. And what residents and others said was, hey, Bill, that's great. We understand. Um, what you're doing, we, we see the results, but how many of the companies you're working with are owned by residents? And I said, well, about 30% of them are owned by uh, women, about 20% are owned by African Americans, and I said, that's significantly better than the national average. How many are owned by residents? I said, goose egg, goose egg, goose egg, goose egg. So we had to go back and reflect and figure out how we could uh, do a better job, and so we put in place a program to help residents uh, from the Hill District, and now we've expanded that program to Homewood, and we will be going into Sharpsburg, too. But to help them create businesses that can connect to the economic prosperity that's taking place in their community and uh, the neighborhood, and we've put together uh, what I think is a really good, good program to do that. Um, we provide uh, them with a little bit of capital, so we have these grant competitions. Uh, uh, we'll have like a $100,000 pot. The goal is not to give away the money. The goal is to give as many people as, as, as wanted entrepreneurial training. Um, but then, you know, from that, determine those uh, folks that have the most potential to create successful businesses. Uh, we formed an incredible relationship with one of our partners, Reed Smith, um, whereby Reed Smith uh, makes these businesses their client and they do soup to nuts legal work. Uh, they've done about $800,000 worth of legal work. They've gotten 75 attorneys engaged, um, and it's their third largest uh, pro bono uh, project nationally. Uh, we also have uh, a mentor uh, that works with them. Uh, our mentor is here, Mr. Dwight Mayo. Um, uh, and so, and, and we're in the process of replicating this program in several, several cities throughout uh, the U.S. Um, but an example of uh, the success is uh, this company Power 59 Construction. Um, Scott's a contractor. When he started, when he came to us, he had two employees. Now he's about 15 and is well positioned to take advantage of uh, a lot of the commercial and construction work that uh, is taking place uh, not just in the Hill District but uh, throughout the city. And there's several other, uh, several other um, good stories. Um, so other programs we have, uh, we created an innovation zone in Homewood because uh, Homewood, very much like the Hill, right next to East Liberty Growth Center, but very much disconnected. And as we're seeing, you know, there's a lot of work with a lot of partners uh, to really uh, create, create some connections. Um, so our internship programs, we talked about that. Citizen Science Lab, uh, this is like tech shop, but it's for the life sciences and it is, kid-centered and kid-focused, but life science companies can use the space, and so we've worked with Duquesne to launch that, and we'll, uh, under the direction of uh, Andre Samuels, who you see here, it will spin out as its own 501c3. And then nationally, we do a lot of nonpartisan, and I'll stress that, policy advocacy around inclusive innovation. So what inspires me is the fact that when we decide that we want to do something here, we can do it. Um, in a way that other cities can't. Um, and the proof of that 
is the public-private partnership that came together when uh, our economy was in the basement. Um, so that, that's, that's what inspires me. Um, what gives me a little pause is that we have to do that around inclusion. And uh, despite a lot of efforts um, and a lot of good words, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. We're, we're seeing some small success here and there, but when we talk about uh, the large scale change that we need to have, we're not there yet. Um, but I'm also really excited, uh, and my time is running out, I have a minute and 30 seconds to hear <laughs> Mr. Rifkin speak. I had the opportunity to read two of his books, and I do a lot of reading. And I can honestly say that those were two of the best books that I've read. Um, because he talks about where we are. You know, being in the tech sector, one of the things that I see is I see diminishing number of jobs, diminishing number of jobs. And I see folks of all levels uh, that don't have that, 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 that security that they had 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and so uh, Mr. Rifkin is really able to talk about that in an incredible way. But more importantly, he talks about the third revolution, the next revolution that we need to have that can create the jobs and then can create the quality of life that um, we all deserve. So within my time limit, which uh, usually I don't do because I like to talk. So without further ado, thank you. Thanks, Bill, for those great words and uh, a wonderful inspiration. Uh, good evening. My name is Grant Irvin. I serve as the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Pittsburgh. Uh, and it's my honor to be here with you this evening. And this is a packed house, Jenna. What did you and Andrew do? I mean, this is, this is amazing. Um, so one thing that always kind of uh, I have to stop and take pause about is uh, just the great work of the Green Building Alliance. Um, I'd like to be a remiss if I wouldn't thank Aurora Sherrard, and I believe this is your inaugural as executive director, number two, my first one. Um, Aurora does a, an amazing job in an, a, a variety of levels, and if you haven't had a chance to meet her, um, please do, and her team is a group of amazing individuals as well. Uh, so it's my pleasure uh, to, to introduce Jeremy Rifkin uh, to you all this evening, and, and you can read his bio, um, and you're going to hear some really amazing words from him. Um, if you've ever heard him speak or if you've read any of his, uh, his works, uh, you'll truly be inspired. You know, one of the things that we take note of here in the city of Pittsburgh is that this is a special time. Uh, you know, every day that we're reminded uh, about the great works that occur across this city, from civil society to the private sector to those of, of us in government, we're in a pivotal transitional time. And because of that time, we need revolutionary leaders like Jeremy Rifkin to help us take the next step. You know, the things that we come across uh, in the world of sustainability and green building and, and into the, the areas of resilience are different. Some of the issues that we face are challenging. They're not simple or easy to explain. But one of the things that we all recognize, I think, is that the opportunity that is in front of us. And one of those key opportunities is kind of the new economy that we're embarking across. And part of that means that we can't think in traditional times. We're dealing now with not symmetrical challenges, but asymmetrical challenges. And because of that, we need asymmetrical solutions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce with you not just a visionary, but a revolutionary in terms of this next generation economy, Mr. Jeremy Rifkin. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back in Pittsburgh. I used to spend quite a bit of time here about 30 years ago. However, I'm going to start on a somber note. I hope it'll end up being a liberating reflection. You'll have to be the judge. First, I'm going to lay some ground rules. All iPads down. All cell phones down. OK? We're going to have an intimate conversation tonight. 
GDP is slowing in every single country in the world today. The reason productivity has been declining for 20 years across this global economy. The result, unemployment is high everywhere, especially among the younger generation. And now our economists are forecasting 20 more years of slow growth. Here's the sad reality. After two industrial revolutions, where do we stand with modern capitalist society today? The 80 richest people in the world today, we could put them in the middle section of this room. The 80 richest human beings on this planet today, their combined wealth equals the accumulated wealth of one half the human population living on this planet, three and a half billion people. There's something fundamentally wrong in the way we're organizing our economic, social, and political life everywhere. And now this economic crisis has given rise to an even more profound environmental crisis. We have had two industrial revolutions. We've spewed massive amounts of CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide into the atmosphere of this little planet. And the short and long of it is, we can't get enough of the sun's energy back off the planet. It's all being blocked by those global warming gases in the atmosphere. We're in real time climate change. I'm gonna to admit to you I've got it wrong for over 45 years. I've been working on this issue for a long time and I thought we had more time. I did not anticipate the feedback loops and the exponential curves. The reason we're all terrified, and everyone here should be terrified, is that climate change now is real time and it's affecting the water cycles of the earth. This is never explained, even at the UN talks, even Al Gore's film. This is affecting the water cycles of the earth. We're the watery planet. We go to other planets, we send out our probes, no water, not interested. We found out there may be some kind of dirty water on the Mars, everyone's excited. Our ecosystems have developed over millions of years on Earth based on the cloud covers and the water regimes, the hydrological cycles that travel this planet. It's all about water. For every one degree <clears throat> that the temperature of this planet goes up, the atmosphere is actually absorbing 7% more precipitation from the ground. The heat is forcing that precipitation up into the clouds. We're getting more concentrated precipitation in the atmosphere and more extreme water events. That's what this is about. So, unknowledgeable people will say, gee, there were eight feet of snow in Boston last year. This does not look like global warming to me. We're getting more extreme winter snows, more dramatic spring floods, more prolonged summer droughts, more category three, four, and five hurricanes. Look at last year. After the snow in Boston, this fall, we had what they called a 1,000 year storm in the Carolinas. This is something that happens every 1,000 years. It is the new normal around the world. My wife and I were in British Columbia and we had to leave after two days because there were fires across the entire west coast from British Columbia through California all summer. Millions of acres destroyed, burned because of drought. This is the new normal. The most powerful hurricane in recorded history just hit the Philippines. This is just 2015. We have a runaway water cycle on an exponential curve. This is the most dangerous, terrifying moment that we faced as a species in our short sojourn on this planet. And our scientists now tell us, and if you're a grandparent or parent, listen to this, that we are in the sixth extinction event of life on Earth. We've had five mass waves of extinction. They came quick. They were all before we were ever here. And the chemistry of the planet shifts, massive die out, quick. And on the average, 10 million years to recover that biodiversity loss. We're in the sixth extinction event in real time. These are not models, we're chronicling it. We could lose over half the species of life on Earth before the end of this century. This is a massive wipeout. This is catastrophic, and as my wife says, we're just not grasping the enormity of the moment. Intellectually, we know about it half our country, most of the rest of the world. But emotionally, we're not terrified to the point of the human race coming together to see if we're gonna survive in the next generation. 
99.5% of all the species that ever inhabited this little oasis in the universe have come and gone. Those are not good odds. There's no guarantee we're going to make it through another century at the rate we're going. So what do we do? We have an economic crisis. The economy stalled. It's given rise to a global environmental crisis, climate change. We need a new economic vision for the world that's compelling. We need a game plan for that vision that's deliverable in real time, in less than 30 years, everywhere. If we have any chance to beat this out so that we have a crisis but not a cataclysm. So we have to step back and ask the question, how do the great economic paradigm shifts in history occur? Because if we know how they occur, we can get a road map here in Pittsburgh and everywhere else to chart a new journey quickly. There have been at least seven major economic paradigm shifts in history. And from an anthropological perspective, they share a common denominator. At a certain moment of time, three defining technologies emerged, and they converged to create what we call in engineering a general purpose technology platform. That's a fancy way of saying an infrastructure that fundamentally changes the way we manage, power, and move economic activity across the value chains. What are those three technologies? Number one, new communication technologies to more efficiently manage the economic activity. Number two, new sources of energy to more efficiently power the economic activity. Number three, new modes of transportation to more efficiently move the economic activity. So when communication technologies converge with new sources of energy and new modes of transportation logistics, fundamentally alters the way we manage power and move economic life. Obvious from an anthropological perspective, what I've just said is not in a single textbook in the world. Not a, I teach at the Wharton schools, the oldest business school in the world. I teach business leaders. No one else in the faculty has a sense of the anthropology, as I can see, of what the economic shifts have been about. Let me give you a couple examples. 19th century, first industrial revolution. 20th century, second industrial revolution. The Brits took us into that first industrial revolution. They invented steam power printing. This was a huge leap forward in managing communication from that old manual Gutenberg print press. We could increase the productivity and really move quickly to put out cheap print communication. Then the Brits laid out that telegraph system in the second half of the 19th century, connecting the British Isles. That communication revolution converged with a new energy source, cheap coal in the hinterlands of England. And then they invented the steam engine to harvest the coal. And then even more ingenious, they put the steam engine on rails for locomotives, national transportation logistics, communication, energy, transport, manage power and move economic life across the value chains, first industrial revolution. Second industrial revolution, United States, 20th century, centralized electricity, Edison, made possible Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. We think the internet's a big deal. Try to imagine the telephone. All of a sudden, instant communication at the speed of light across vast distances, later radio and television in the 20th century, those communication technologies converge with cheap Texas oil, powered by a German invention, the internal combustion engine, and then Henry Ford put everybody on the road. Communication, energy, transport, manage power, and move economic life. That second industrial revolution took the whole world through the 21st to 20th century, and it actually peaked in the 21st century in July 2008. Try to remember that month. Brent crude oil hit a record, $147 a barrel on world markets. And when that happened in July 2008, the whole global economy, see, economy stopped. Silence. Nothing moving. Why? This was the great economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. All our policy people are still concerned about the aftershock. They haven't dealt with the earthquake. It's all about oil and fossil fuels. We're the carbon people. If we survive this period in history, future generations will look back on us maybe 100,000 years from now and they'll say, oh yeah, 
We had the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Those were the carbon people. They lived off the carbon deposits of the Carboniferous era, and they built a short-lived civilization that almost took us to the abyss. Fertilizers, pesticides, construction materials, most of our pharmaceutical products, synthetic fiber, power, transport, heat, and light, it goes on and on. It's all made out of fossil fuels. So when oil starts to go over 95 a barrel, all the other prices start to go up. And at around 120 a barrel, prices become prohibitive. Purchasing power slows. We are in an end game. Every time we try to regrow, oil prices up, other prices up. Purchasing power shuts down around 118 a barrel. And the only reason we have $40 a barrel oil is they're all fighting among themselves now in the fossil fuel industry at the last stages of this era. OPEC has put out the put a lot of productivity out there, a lot of oil out there to reduce the price with a lot of oil glutting the market and they're wiping out shale gas across the United States and tar sand in Canada and that's why Keystone didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's over because those fuels are not competitive under 60 a barrel and as soon as they're wiped out by this time next year you will not hear about shale gas anymore in the United States of America. Oil prices go back up. Let me share an anecdote with you. When Angela Merkel became Chancellor of Germany, she asked me to come to Berlin, actually in the very first couple of weeks of her new government, to help her address the question, how do we grow the German economy and create jobs on her watch? When I got to Berlin, the first question I asked the Chancellor is, Madam Chancellor, how do you grow the German economy or the European Union economy or the global economy when your businesses are all plugged into a second industrial revolution infrastructure of the 20th century based on centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion, road, rail, water, and air transport, and we have optimized the productivity potential of that platform. It's not moving for 20 years. That's why productivity is declining. Let me stop for a moment. Economists are writing these breathless tracks on why is productivity declining? We have all these killer new products out of Silicon Valley and the kids are producing all these new things. Why is productivity declining? I'm going to let you in on a dirty little secret. No economist wants to talk about this. We used to believe that there were two factors in productivity. More capital for better machines, capitalism, and better performing workers. But when Robert Solo won the Nobel Prize for Economic Growth Theory, I think it was around 1986 or 7, he let the little secret out. He said, well, we used to think these are the two factors that make up productivity, but when we track every single year of the Industrial Revolution, those two factors only account for about 14% of all the productivity. Where's the other 86% of productivity come from? Don't know. It's called the Solo Residual. Moses Abramowitz, former head of the American Economic Association, he put together the Stanford Economics Department. He said, quote, this is a measure of our ignorance. Are you shocked? Econ Wouldn't you think economists would know the central dogma? What is productivity? Here's why they didn't know. And this is really important. When economic theory was penned in the late 1700s by the economic philosophers, the vogue was Newton's physics. Everybody loved Newton's physics. And they wanted to use Newton's metaphors to be more scientific. So you know uh, Newton's law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And guess what? Adam Smith borrowed that metaphor to pen his critical idea of the invisible hand. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, supply and demand. The first law of motion, a body in motion stays in motion, less disrupted by an outside force. Baptists say the French economists borrowed that metaphor for his theory that supply will stimulate demand, which will generate supply, which will stimulate demand, less disrupted by an outside force. All of classical and neoclassical economic theory is wedded to these Newtonian physics metaphors. There's only one problem. Newton's physics has absolutely nothing to do with economics. Economics is governed by the same laws that govern the universe, that govern the biosphere, that govern every single activity we do as living creatures on this planet. And those laws are the first and second laws of thermodynamics, the energy laws, and non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Very simple. 
How many are engineers here? Architects. You all have to study this. If you're a biologist here, an engineer, an architect, city planner, you all study thermodynamics. That's why you can't talk to the economists, because not one business school in the world requires that they learn the basic laws that govern all economic activity. You know more about economics than we do. Here's the first law of energy. All the energy in the universe is constant. That big bang, that little cluster that out in the galaxies, all the energy that is here was here from the Big Bang. It'll be here to the final whimper of the universe. We've never created new energy or destroyed. It's here. Conservation law. The second law says, yes, the energy is here. It's constant, but it always changes form, but only in one direction, from concentrated, that little cluster, to dispersed, from hot to cold, from available to unavailable. Entropy is a measure of the energy still here, but it's so dispersed it can't do useful work. There are three systems in the universe, open, closed, and isolated. An open system exchanges matter and energy with the outside world. That's A. B, there are systems that exchange energy with the outside world, but not matter. Matter is a form of energy. C, there are isolated systems that exchange neither matter or energy with the outside world. The Earth, in relation to the solar system, is B. We're closed. We have plenty of energy for the sun, no problem. But in terms of the fixed matter, which is a form of energy, it's pretty well set. As we blew off the sun, whatever fixed matter is here, down there, the rare earths, the metallic ores, that's fixed. We get a few meteorites falling on us and a little cosmic dust, but that's about it. You all have your smartphones on you. There's 30 little rare earth granules in that phone. They came from the earth as it blew off the sun. Here's what economics is. We collect low entropy available energy, and that can be anything from a rare earth, a metallic ore, a fossil fuel, whatever's down in that earth. We collect it out of nature. It's available to do work. Then we move it around in our value chain. We move it, we store it, we produce goods and services, we consume it, and we recycle it. Those are value chains. At every step of conversion on those value chains, we have to embed energy into the product or service to transform it to its next stage. But we lose energy in the process. The lost energy is entropy. Let me give you an example. Everyone here took biology. When a predator eats a victim, let's say a lion chases down an antelope. I wouldn't have put this system together the way it is. But when a, a lion chases down an antelope and devours it, about 10 to 20 percent of that antelope's total energy is embedded into the predator. The rest is actually heat loss in the process of getting it all done. That's what we call aggregate efficiency, the ratio of potential to useful work. Keep this in mind. So at every step of conversion, we try to embed energy in to get it to the next stage of that product or service. We lose energy. So here's what I said to the chancellor on that first day. She's a physicist by background. I said, Madam Chancellor, the United States started the second industrial revolution in 1903 at 3% aggregate efficiency, the ratio of potential work to the actual useful work you actually embed. By 1990, the U.S. got to 13% aggregate efficiency, meaning 87% of every conversion, the energy, the materials, lost. Nothing's changed since then in the U.S. 13% aggregate efficiency, the ratio of potential to use of work across the value chain. Japan actually led the world. Got to 20% aggregate efficiency in 1990. Nothing's changed. Why is this important? A new generation of economists trained in physics have gone back and they've looked at every single year of the Industrial Revolution and they've put in one more factor. Better machines, better workers, aggregate efficiency, the ratio of potential to useful work. And guess what they found out? That accounts for most of the rest of the productivity. Henry Ford could have told you that. He wasn't the brightest bulb in the chandelier. But what he did understand is that that electricity that they brought out on that, on that grid allowed him to use electric power tools and bring the work to the workers. That's aggregate efficiency was increased. So what I said to the chancellor is this. In the EU, we can have market reforms, labor reforms, fiscal reforms. We can have all sorts of new killer Silicon Valleys and promote entrepreneurialism. But if you're stuck in that second industrial revolution platform of centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel, nuclear power, internal combustion, road, rail, water, air, no country in the world can get above the ceiling of about 
20% aggregate efficiency, which is most of productivity. It's stalled. It's the platform. And on that day, I introduced to her a third industrial revolution, a new uh, convergence of communication, energy, and transport. And at the end of the day, the chancellor, who keeps it pretty close to the vest, she said, Mr. Rifkin, we will have this third industrial revolution in Germany. Now, I'm going to report to you a little later on what's been done in the last 10 years. You probably saw the New York Times piece this, year, this week. I'll report to you back. The communication internet we all used. It's been about 20 years since the World Wide Web. The communication internet today is converging in Europe and now in China, where I'm working, with a digitalized renewable energy internet and an automated GPS and soon driverless transport and logistics internet, road, rail, water, and air, to create three internets in one. This is a super internet to manage, power, and move economic life. Communication internet, renewable energy internet, automated driverless transport and logistics internet. This super internet to manage power and move economic life is riding on top of a platform called the Internet of Things. You're reading a lot about the Internet of Things. We're embedding sensors in every device and every machine so they can monitor real-time economic activity. We have actually sensors in the agricultural fields, and they're monitoring the water, the salinity, the growth of the crops, and they're sending big data. But to where? Communication, energy, and transport to manage power and move economic life. We have sensors in the factories, smart homes, smart vehicles, Warehouses and distribution centers, they can track your Federal Express package and know what it, where it is at any given hour. So we are place, placing sensors across the economy and the environment. We're creating an external brain, a prothesis, an actual technological external brain for the central nervous system of the planet. On the upside, this is a potential, in quotes, great leap forward for humanity. We now have the possibility of laying out a global external brain so that everyone with little cheap mobile technologies can go up there and engage each other directly. Eliminate the middlemen. All those giant vertically integrated organizations that led us to the 1% and the 99%. And we can engage each other directly. This allows us to begin to think as a single human family in all of our distributed diversity, because this is a distributed, not a centralized grid. It has enormous benefits, but the moment we think about how exciting this is, we can think as a human family living in one planet for the first time, and we have to share all of this because you can't have a centralized center, it's a distributed technological platform, immediately we get chilled by the prospect. Uh, Hmm, everything connected, 100 trillion sensors, ubiquitous connectivity. Immediately we think about the dark net and the dark side. How do we protect network neutrality here when everyone's connected? How do we ensure that governments and corporations do not purloin this Internet of Things platform for a third industrial revolution for political ends or commercial enclosure? How do we protect privacy? How do we guarantee data security? How do we guarantee your creative content is used the way you want and not put in other hands, whether it's Google, Facebook, or Twitter? How do we assure against disruption in the system from cybercrime and now cyber terrorism and the breakdown of the system? How do we build resiliency into the platform? These are the issues you've probably been reading that we're spending a lot of time in Brussels on this. We're a little bit ahead of the game here. And we realize if we don't deal equally with the dark side and the dark net, we will not get to this new world. But we need to get to this new world because this is the only way we know to try to address climate change and create a more democratic economy. So let's say for tonight we can begin to address this. And I should say these issues I've just raised, this is the political struggle of the next three, four generations. A lot of young people will be around to see whether you were able to succeed or whether it failed. It cannot fail. But let's assume we can deal with the dark side. Here's the benefit. Everyone in this room has a value chain, whether you're a family or small business, a large company or a government, school system. So you can go up on this Internet of Things platform with your little cheap smartphone here on your, in your pocket purse, all right? 
and you can have a transparent picture of all the economic data going across the world. You think Snowden is a big deal? This is an open, transparent system if it stays neutral. Even big companies didn't have this data. My first week at the Wharton School in 1963, my professor said, Mr. Rifkin, wake up. Caveat emptor, Mr. Rifkin. I thought, what is that, Latin, Latin, Latin? It means let the buyer beware. Sellers never want the buyers to know what the sellers know. That's a little hidden, you know, the game is a little bit stacked, like in Vegas. Now, everybody will know the economic data going on in society. So let's say you're a small or medium-sized enterprise here in Pittsburgh. You can go up with your cheap, smart technology onto this platform at very low cost. All you need is a service provider. And you can cut your big data on your value chain out of all the rest of the big data. Then you can apply your own analytics to your big data. You can establish your own algorithms, your own apps. So you can dramatically increase your aggregate efficiency at every step of conversion on your little value chain for your business. And by doing so, dramatically increase your productivity, dramatically reduce your marginal cost and ecological footprint, which I'll talk about later. And some of the marginal costs are going to get low so you can be in a streamlined capitalist market. Some of the marginal costs are approaching zero. And that's giving rise to the sharing economy and a whole new system beyond the market. You're all hearing about the sharing economy? What the hell is this? Airbnb and couch surfing and Wikipedia. What is this sharing economy? Capitalism's given birth. We never thought it would happen. It's a kind of a mature system. It's given birth to a progeny. It's called the sharing economy on the collaborative commons. This little sharing economy is it's embryonic, it's not formed, it's, but it's flourishing alongside the parent, capitalism. Now, in any parent-child relationship, there's some adjustment. The parent, capitalism, is trying to figure out what to do with this child. It wasn't expected. A little love child here. <laughs> it, so, and sometimes it's trying to absorb this little sharing economy into the capitalist parent. At other times, the child's trying to transform the parent and says, maybe I want to be absorbed, maybe I want to create my own identity here. What I'm saying to you is this is the first new economic system to enter onto the world stage since capitalism and socialism in the first half of the 19th century. It's really a remarkable historical event. Capitalism will not disappear, but to the extent that capitalism and the parent can find value in nurturing this child, letting it create its own identity, let it mature, and finding a way to partner with it, capitalism will still flourish. But it will no longer be the primary arbiter of economic life. It's going to have to share the center stage with a grown-up child who's going to be on the same plane. We're already seeing it with every, all the young people here. How many of you are millennials under 32? You're already there. You're in a hybrid economic system. Part of the day, you're exchanging goods and services in the market, right? And part of the day, you're involved in sharing all sorts of virtual goods and services for nearly free in the sharing economy outside the market. Right now, Let's see how this has affected, this third industrial revolution has been affected. The first of the three internets is here. It'll tell us what's going to happen to the other two internets. Communication internet's here. We have three billion people connected. Pretty soon the entire human race. Uh, Wang Yang, the vice premier of China, I'm working with him. He said, uh, a couple visits ago, he said, Jeremy, we got a $25 smartphone now with more power than sent your boys to the moon. Everyone's going to be connected, no matter where you are in the developing world, within the next 10 years. So, what's, what this means is that you can, at this point in time, go up there on this Internet of Things and you can change the way we organize economic life, fundamentally. Let's take a look at prosumers. We have sellers and buyers. We have owners and workers. That's traditional first and second industrial revolution, industrial capitalism. But we got a new category here, prosumers. At any given time during the day, there are millions of people literally producing their own music with cheap digital technology, studio quality. How much does it cost to have a little cheap digital technology to produce your own music, studio quality? Then, that's the fixed cost. The marginal cost are the cost of then producing an additional unit and sharing it or selling it to somebody else. The fixed costs are really low to produce your own music. The marginal cost whether you send that music to one person or a billion people on the web, it's the same cost. It's near zero marginal cost. All you need is a service provider, right? 
We have millions of young people prosuming videos, YouTube videos, open source, no intellectual property. They are producing and sharing these videos with each other. And the, what's the cost of producing a video with your smartphone and then sharing it with a billion people? That Korean performance artist, what was it last year? What was his name? The, the dance, the musical? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. He brought a billion people to that website in one month. Um, unbelievable. And it didn't cost him anything. We have young people producing and sharing their own news blog and social media at near zero marginal cost. We have millions of people contributing to Wikipedia. They're constructing the knowledge of the world democratically, laterally, not centrally, near zero marginal cost. And we got six million college students taking massive open online college courses blended with physical courses. But those courses are zero marginal cost. This is a revolution. Whole industries have been disrupted since Napster, the little file sharing, oh, all the guilty parties, look at them there. <laughs> we went from there to Pirate Bay. I should say that my books have been, I shouldn't tell you this, my books came out on those pirate uh, systems before we could publish, and they were ranking them before Amazon. <laughs> and you can't beat it. It's really extraordinary. You know? <laughs> so whole industries have been disrupted. The music industry is, is not collapsed, but it's a shadow of itself. Uh, television is really shrunk because everyone's producing and sharing beyond the market for free for each other. They're the new content. We've got newspapers and magazines going out of business all over the place. How do they compete with a zero marginal causes blog and e free ebooks? It goes on and on. However, new industries have formed thousands and thousands of new startups, some of them profit, some of them nonprofit, not just Google, Facebook, Twitter. Thousands of startups both profit and nonprofit, they're creating the platforms, the apps, and the connections for the sharing economy. Some of them profit, but then they're actually creating platforms so that other industries no longer are that necessary, and you can produce and share for each other outside the market in abundance for free. We thought there'd be a firewall, and that while the zero marginal cost phenomenon would affect the virtual world of bits, we just didn't think it would move to the physical world of atoms. That firewall has been breached, and that's what I state in the Zero Marginal Cost Society in much greater detail in the book. What's happened is millions and millions of people now in Europe are producing their own solar and wind electricity right now, tonight, at near zero marginal cost, pretty soon around the world. Millions of young people are in car sharing networks, and pretty soon they're going to be automated GPS and driverless at almost low to near zero marginal cost, and we're coming on with the drones very low marginal cost. And we got millions of young people in the last four years that are doing 3D printing and producing all sorts of physical products and those costs in some ways are moving towards zero. It's a revolution. Let's go back to Germany. What's happened since that first day of the Chancellor? We're now at 28, we're now at 28 percent of the electricity of Germany is now solar and wind right now will be 35% of all the electricity in this country will be solar and wind within five years. Will be 40% in 10 years. Will be 100% in 20 years. Yeah. The fixed cost of solar and wind is on an exponential curve just like computers. Now, when I was a kid in the 1940s, okay, we still had coal in the furnace in our school. Yes, I did have shoes going to school. So in the 1940s and 50s, in the 1940s and, and 50s, computers cost millions of dollars. There were only a few. And the chairman of IBM predicted that we would need seven computers for the whole world. It's kind of off on that prediction. <laughs> we did not anticipate Moore's Law and the Intel's company's computer chip. The engineers were able, ingenious, to double the capacity and half the cost of those little chips every two years. And now China has a smartphone, $25. Exponential curves, not linear. We've had the same exp similar exponential curves for solar and wind for 20 years. And even the policy leaders, I mean, they have no clue. They say, oh, Bill Gates gets up there. I like Bill Gates, but he gets up there and he says, we're going to have to find all the new technologies, R&D, that can solve this problem. They're already here. Somebody needs to call him up because they're spending billions. We have to go into the laboratory and we have to get a lot of money together. To, here's, what, here's where we're at. A solar watt. Some of you remember, it cost $78 to generate one little solar watt in the 1970s. It costs 50 cents to generate that watt today. $78, 50 cents. It'll be 35 cents 
in 18 months from now. And I uh, chair a global consult, uh, consortium. We, we lay out these regional master plans around the world. Some of our power companies, they're buying up long-term solar and wind contracts quietly in America and Europe for four cents a kilowatt hour, 20-year contracts. We know the exponential curves. And then you have all these TV commercials from Exxon saying, we're independent because of shale gas. It's just pitiful. So once you pay for the fixed costs, and those fixed costs are going to be as cheap as smartphones, your geothermal heat pump, your bioconverter, your solar in the paint, your solar through the glass and on the facades of the building, everyone's going to have this. And I don't care where you are, all across sub-Saharan Africa, everywhere, all the poorest parts of the world. But the marginal cost of this energy now in Germany for actually almost 30% right now of the electricity, it's near zero. The sun has not sent us a bill in Germany. <laughs> the wind has yet to invoice us, and the geothermal heat is very quiet, no charge. What's happened to the big four power companies? We have EMBW, RWE, Eon, and Vattenfall. We thought they were invincible 10 years ago, these giant vertically integrated global companies, and what's happened to them in 10 years is what happened to the music industry, and newspapers, and television, and book publishing. Millions of small players came together, farmers, urbanites, small and medium-sized technology parks, local governments, and they all created electricity cooperatives, which are shared commons, shared commons. Every one of them got low interest loans from the banks because the banks knew they could pay back by the premium energy they were generating and sending back to the grid. No one turned down. No big subsidies. The only subsidy was the feed-in tariff that allowed them premium energy back to the grid. And then they changed the rate price to the consumers. The rate bill goes up a little bit. But that hump is now getting over because we're now reducing the feed-in tariffs because all of the technology is moving to parity less than 20 years, while the fossil fuel and nuclear industry is getting t so much more subsidies than all the money that's being offered at the COP21 to help developing countries adjust. They get more money in one year in subsidies than the next 10 years they're fighting about to get money to the developing countries to deal with climate change. It's just absolutely horrific. So all of these uh, millions of people are producing their own electricity in co-ops. This is power to the people, literally and figuratively. And the big four power companies are producing less than 7%. They're out of the game. Because they were the most efficient organizations for centralized power. Let me be clear. Fossil fuel and nuclear power required huge amounts of capital. And the only business uh, organization that would work is vertically integrated, centralized economies of scale to control everything from the extraction to the distribution. It was the most efficient mechanism. But when you get to the renewable energies, they're ubiquitous, but you have to collect them everywhere. They're not centralized like an oil field. You have to collect the sun in every building, in every site. Or you have to collect the wind wherever you are, or the geothermal heat wherever you inhabit. That requires a lateral economy to scale, millions of small players collecting small amounts, storing it. We have to have storage, hydrogen, flywheels, batteries. And then you send it back to the grid or go off grid. And you create much more power than we'd ever create with these little centralized nuclear power plants. This power, though, is clean. It's ubiquitous. And it takes us off global warming quickly. Does this mean the end of the power and transmission companies? No, but they have to change their business model. And we established a new business model for them seven years ago, and at first their body language was not good, not going there. We said, look, get used to this. You're not getting out of the second industrial revolution tomorrow morning, but this is a quick exponential curve, and you're going to have to be both in the second and the third industrial revolution. That's good business. And that means you have to have both a vertically integrated centralized energy model and a distributed model as well for the energy internet. If not, you won't be here. So it's a long-term, it's a short-term transition over 20, 30 years in Germany. So we said in the new business model, you'll make more money by selling less and less electricity. That's where we lose them. He said, that's not possible. We say, yes, it is. What you're going to do is you're going to help erect and manage the energy internet. You're going to help with the telecom and IT companies and electronic companies and the star smart startup companies to digitalize that energy internet that electricity grid, turn it into an energy internet. Then you can help, along with all sorts of other enterprises, manage that energy internet. 
And the way you'll make money is by setting up partnerships with thousands of enterprises. You help them manage their big data on their value chains. You help them with their algorithms and their analytics and their apps so they can dramatically increase their aggregate efficiency, dramatically increase their productivity, reduce their marginal costs to stay competitive in the capitalist market and move to the sharing economy. In return, those enterprises will share some of those productivity gains back with you, the power company. It's called performance contracts. Seven years ago, the chairman of, e of uh, E.ON, we had a three-hour debate in the Netherlands. This is the German company. He said, we're never going to do that. They did it this spring. They sold off their fossil fuel and nuclear division. They're moving to energy management. And in northern industrial France, where my group's laying out this plan with the region of nord calais the oldest industrial region in France, guess who's there with us? EDF, ERDF, RWE, GDF, Suez. Don't wait for Exxon. It'll never hear the song. <laughs> They're going to be history. But the European companies, Total is just beginning, GDF, Suez, the power companies, this is smart business. And it's not just Europe. What's happened that's interesting is um, when the new leadership came in, Chairman Xi and Premier Li in China, I actually thought this was a joke. I was on Google at Christmas a few years ago, and I said to my wife, someone's hacked in and played a joke on me. Premier Li put out his official biography, and up front he said, well, he was a fan and read the Third Industrial Revolution. I said, I don't even know this guy. I don't even spend any time in China. And he was deadly serious. He instructed the government to begin moving on this as the economic plan for China. Four weeks ago, the Huffington Post reported, I've been spending a lot of time with the government, that the new five-year plan has adopted everything I'm telling you here tonight. Then we talked about, here's how fast they move. After my first, you remember Obama said, well, we made this great deal with China and they're going to go into renewal. That's because of what we've doing there. So here's how fast they move. After my first formal visit, the chairman, 11 weeks later, the chairman of the uh, state grid of China, which is the big electricity grid, announced an $82 billion four-year startup to digitalize the electricity grid of China starting this year so that millions of Chinese people could produce their own solar and wind locally and share it back to the grid. Watch Germany, watch China, watch EU, watch China. The coming together, the communication internet with, an, with a digitalized renewable energy internet gives rise to an automated GPS and driverless road, rail, water, and air transportation internet. The automobile was the centerpiece of the second industrial revolution. We built the whole global economy on buying automobiles. The problem here, where are my millennials again? You have thrown us a curve. You've really messed things up. Because apparently, you don't want to own cars anymore. That's grandma and grandpa, two cars, sitting there doing nothing about most of the day. You want access to mobility in automated transport networks, not ownership of vehicles. So my wife and I are with this really great little Ethiopian restaurant out in, uh, in Washington, the capital. So we're looking outside, and this hip young uh, millennial couple, he takes out his smartphone. We knew what they were doing on the corner. He connects up to the communication internet that immediately moves him to GPS, the transport internet. They find a vehicle by GPS 90 seconds from where they are. It took about 90 seconds. We timed it. PayPal paid. Why would you ever want to own a car again? Everybody's got instant transport. And what I'm saying is this, beginning with the millennial generation, and this I guarantee, short of an abyss that hits us first, you're never going to own cars again. Your millennials, your kids, your grandchildren, because you're going to prefer sharing vehicles in these networks. And these networks are, for every car shared right now, I want you to think of this the next time you get in a car share. For every car shared, 15 cars are being eliminated from production right now. Yeah, so Larry Burns was the former executive vice president of General Motors until five years ago. Now, Larry just did a study. He's a professor at the University of Michigan. Listen to this. He studied Ann Arbor, middle-sized city. And what he found, even at this stage of development of this incipient automated uh, transport internet, we can eliminate 80% of the vehicles right now in Ann Arbor, right now, and have just as good mobility cheaper. Now, extrapolate his study. We've got a billion cars, buses, and trucks in the world choking us in traffic, and they're the number three cause of global warming emissions. Number one is buildings, which we're going to get to here pretty soon. But in Germany, we've already retrofitted, you have to retrofit first, every, two million buildings, and then transform them into micro power plants. 
We're going to transform every building, and we'll get to this, the core of what I'm here tonight to do. We're going to transform every building into a power plant. So that's number one. Number three is transport, but I'm going to have to talk about number two because no one seems to want to talk about the number two cause of global warming. Does anyone know what it is? Buildings is one, transport is three. Yeah, beef production and consumption. And when I wrote the book Beyond Beef in 1990 suggesting this, the cattle industry and all the pundits said, you are out of your mind. We now know, the science is, was in back then, it's the number two cause of climate change. It's methane, it's nitrous oxide, it's CO2. And even Al Gore, who I deeply respect, he's done a lot to bring this issue. He doesn't want to seem to talk about this. If we can't change our diet and move down the food chain, my Lord. Number three is transport. Take Larry Burns' study seriously. We're going to eliminate 80% of the vehicles between the millennials, their children, and grandchildren. The other 200 million vehicles are going to be electric. They're going to be fuel cell. They're going to be 3D printed with recom composite, recycled material. The Stratus is already out. It's already commercially there. And these vehicles are going to be driverless on automated networks at near zero marginal cost. This is not 20 years away. Nevada has just given permission from Daimler Trucks to operate their driverless trucks in the state of Nevada on the commercial roads. Lateral power. How do we pay for this? How does Pittsburgh pay for this? Let me stop for a moment before I talk about this. I know that Pittsburgh, look, Pittsburgh was a, a kind of a miracle in a sense. For some reason here in Pittsburgh, you had the foresight back 25, 30 years ago to realize, you know, the old industrial revolution's dying. We're not going to turn ourselves into a rust belt. And you made a shift. Other cities across the Midwest did not do as well. But if you want to make a shift again, you can't make the mistake that President Obama made. And I voted for him twice. I think in my lifetime, very mature politician, I actually deeply admire him. But he made a big mistake. He invested billions of dollars of U.S. stimulus money to create a green economy, correct? There is no green economy. Why? Because the mentality in this country is we need a thousand Steve Jobs. We should invest all our money in trying to get new startups that have killer new technologies that are going to take us into this green world. So the administration, the government, would invest in a, bat a battery factory over here or an electric vehicle factory over there. What they missed is that's not how the paradigm shifts occur. They occur when you change the platform. In Germany, businesses are starting to plug into a platform of communication, energy, and transport where it's near zero marginal cost, the energy. At every step of conversion on every value chain of every business, how do you compete with that if you're still in fossil fuels and nuclear power? You have to change the platform. So then you can create the new business models and the new killer services and apps to create the platform, then create the new businesses that come out of the platform. Millions of new businesses came out of the second industrial revolution platform. You had to put in the highways, you had to put in the electricity, you had to put in the pipelines, you had to put in the, the cars of the factories. Then you have new businesses. And then they increase their productivity. So in Brussels, we had a, did we provide a memorandum for everybody here. I think it's up on the web on the EU-China memorandum. That's the memorandum that I developed for President Juncker in Europe and for the premier in China. You should read that memorandum. It's 20 pages. And in this memorandum, we talk about how do we pay for this? Well, in Brussels, we said this. We have all the money. You have all the money in Pittsburgh. We all have the money. It's where it's being used. We spent in the EU, which is still the biggest economy in the world in terms of GDP, slightly bigger than our 50 states are the 28 states in the EU. It is the largest economy. In 2012, we spent 740 billion uh, equivalent US dollars on infrastructure. In a bad year, during a recession, Public and private investments, $740 billion for one year, infrastructure. We spent it on new old. We kept plugging up the old second industrial revolution platform of centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel, nuclear power, internal combustion, transport, and we can't get any more productivity out of it. If we simply changed our investment priorities and put some of it in laying out in every region of Europe, and now in America, a third industrial revolution platform, we bring businesses back to work to create 30 years of infrastructure, and we create all sorts of new businesses that plug into it. We've now changed our investment priorities in Europe. 
this March, we announced it, I laid out this platform, we had Chancellor Merkel and Juncker in the room. We're now using European investment funds for digital communication, energy, and transport, leverage against private equity. Pittsburgh, go look and see how much money you spend on in investment each year, public and private, here in the, Pets in the Pittsburgh metropolitan region for a million people. And then see where that infrastructure is. And then tell me how you're going to get any more productivity out of it. Patch it up, but don't keep relying on it. Every industry would be involved in the infrastructure build out. Telecom, cable, IT, consumer electronics, manufacturing, power and electricity, and really construction and real estate. And this puts everyone back to work. Let me talk about real estate in the last few minutes. How many people here from the construction and real estate industry? How many? I thought there'd be a lot more. All right. Here's what we're doing in China and now in Europe. In China, we have a problem because we overbuilt, just like the United States did. Remember, we built out the interstates, put in all the suburban shopping malls after World War II, and we overbuilt. And in 1988, we had too many empty strip malls and condos no one were buying. Then we went into a huge recession, never came out. We just exhausted the family savings, went into subprime mortgages, and the rest is history. So China now is overbuilt. So Here's a, a plan that we put together for China, but it's equally apropos here. We have to reconceive the notion of a building. We think of a building as where you work or play. It's true, but it has a now another function. Every building is now a node in a third industrial revolution, digital, internet of things, interconnected world. Those buildings are nodes. They're big data centers for com managing communication. They're micro power plants to produce, generate, and share energy on the energy internet, renewables. And they are transport hubs for electric and fuel cell outlets and GPS guidance. So here's how we bring everyone back to work. First of all, we have to retrofit every single building in the United States of America. We're starting that in countries around Europe. We have to make them efficient. We have to put in the insulation. You can't put them into a micro power plant uh, uh, if, if you still don't, if you have leaking energy. This is very labor intensive business that requires millions of semi skilled, skilled professional architectural labor. We have to retrofit every building. Then we have to install solar, wind, geothermal, and other technologies on and around the building. Pretty soon we'll have it in the paint, the glass, the facades. That takes real workers. Robots can't do that. Then we have to transform that node into a, uh, a GPS-guided transport hub, who's going to put in all the charging stations? Who's going to make all this stuff? That's going to require human beings across every single labor category for 40 years. And we can pay for it by reprioritizing our funds. And the way we're doing it in China is ESCOs, ESCOs, ESCOs. In the next five-year plan, there are going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of energy savings companies certified and those energy savings companies, they get loans, low interest from the banks, and tax advantages from the regional and, and central government, ESCOs. Then those ESCOs with those low interest loans, they retrofit all the buildings. So if you own the building, you get a free ride. They get paid back the ESCOs by the energy savings. So there's no way to lose. The banks can do this, and there's no loss. Then you create, the ESCOs are then used to install the technology, solar, wind, geothermal, on the buildings paid back by the premium energy, and you get the low interest loans. Then you move it to the electric charging stations, et cetera, ESCOs, low interest loans, tax advantages, and you don't need to put any more money into the hopper, and then everybody that owns that real estate or manages it, a free ride. We're doing that in China. You could do that in Pittsburgh tomorrow morning. We're doing that in Europe. We're now in northern France. We're in half of the Netherlands on a plan from Rotterdam to The Hague. We're in all of Luxembourg. This is what's going on. Come and visit us. Bring a delegation from your government and industry. And meet your counterparts in government, the business community, the scientific community in these regions in Europe. Last thought. Why is, what does this have to do with climate change? This plan that we're talking about all the businesses and industries and science and engineers that are involved with this, we don't know of any other way that we have any chance, if we have any chance at all, to address climate change quickly. This is an economic plan. It's not a sustainability plan. 
But this plan takes us out of the second industrial revolution in three decades, increases productivity, and reduces ecological footprint as well as marginal cost. Why? Zero marginal cost. This is what sustainability is about. Everyone uses the word. No one needs what it means, knows what it means. Zero marginal cost is extreme aggregate efficiency, which is extreme productivity. If 7 billion people have little teeny mobile devices so they can go up on an Internet of Things and dramatically increase their aggregate efficiency with analytics and apps that you can just build in at every step of conversion, it means that we're using less of the Earth and getting more energy out of it each conversion and less loss so we can use less. That's real sustainability from an engineering perspective. Then if what we do create and produce across those value chains, if it's shared, share the vehicles, share the homes with couch surfing and Airbnb, share the toys and toy websites, then more of us are using less of the earth, we're redistributing it in a circular economy over and over and over again. It's ownership to access, it's markets to networks, it's consumerism to sustainability, it's high quality of life. We put in the energy internet for renewables and the whole human race should be producing their own green electricity within 25 years off-grid and sharing it back to the grid across continents and an automated GPS driverless transport system, we eliminate 80% of the materials that we don't need anymore. Electric fuel cell, recycled materials, 3D printed. As my wife says, this is not rocket science. Well, <laughs> none of this. This is common sense from a business point of view. It can be done tomorrow morning. Do it in Pittsburgh. Last thought. The tech, I'm not a technological determinist, and I'm not a futurist, and I'm not uh, an optimist by any means. If you read my books, I'm pretty critical of technology. Technology, occasionally you create technology that allows you a new platform, but that's just an enabler. The real shift has to be the change in consciousness, or it'll never happen. This business model will never happen unless there's a change in consciousness. What we're beginning to see is a fundamental shift in consciousness around three categories. The way we view freedom. I'm going to test all the millennials here. Don't mess them up here. I hope you get it right. The way we view freedom, the way we view power, and the way we view community. Let's take freedom. For the older generations, we think of freedom from the Enlightenment until our 20th century. Freedom is the ability to be an autonomous agent to be self-sufficient, to be independent, to not be beholden on others, to be an island to ourselves, then we're free because we're self-sufficient and autonomous. That's the basic drive. That's Adam Smith's dictum. So for us, freedom is exclusivity, the ability to be autonomous and on our own. Okay? For a young generation that grew up on the Internet and now the Internet of Things, autonomy is death. For them, freedom is not exclusivity, it's inclusivity. If freedom means, if this is the definition of freedom, the ability to flourish to the full extent of our one and only life, then for millennials that have grown up on the internet, freedom is measured by the richness of their relationships, the networks they're engaged in, not their autonomous existence. It's a completely different idea of freedom. We're gonna to have to redo the French and American constitutions here. <laughs> Because ours are based on this idea of exclusivity and property and ownership, but a whole younger generation is moving from ownership to access, markets to networks. Secondly, there's a different, do I get this one right? Where are the millennials? Where are you? Uh, hopefully. Now, you have a different idea than power than we do. When we think of power, the older generation, we always think of a pyramid. Power has to be pyramidal, correct? It has to be centralized, tapped down. That's what we mean by power, the few to the many. But if you ask anyone that grew up on the Internet, they think power in a different way. They think about it. When they judge a government or a political party or an educational system or a business that they want to become part of in a career, they ask, is this institutional behavior at this organization, is it centralized? Is it vertically integrated? Is it top down? Is it closed and proprietary and patriarchal? Or is the behavior in this institution distributed? Is it collaborative in form? Is it open and transparent? 
Is it laterally scaled power so people can share their talents with each other and increase their social capital on the networks and benefit the networks and benefit themselves? That's a completely different idea about power. The third industrial revolution platform is very different than the first and second because they were designed to be vertically integrated because we were dealing with centralized communication and energy and transport. But the third industrial revolution architecture, its actual architecture is to be distributed, collaborative, open, transparent. And if you close it and lose that, you don't get the value of the platform. You have to be smart at the ends, not at the center. It's totally distributed. So if you want to try to turn it into something you can control from the top, you lose the platform. So it's a wasted venture. Last thought, community. I grew up in a post-West failure world. After that 30-year war, we decided to create the nation state. The nation state was a product of the market uh, forces and then industrial capitalism. And in the nation state, we believe every individual is a sovereign, autonomous unit, driving for our own self-sufficiency, Adam Smith. And then every nation is a sovereign, just like every individual is a sovereign. And just as each individual competes with every other individual for scarce resources, every nation competes with every other nation in the marketplace or the battlefield for scarce resources in a zero-sum game. Sovereign, 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 compete, correct? Well, we have a younger generation now that's moving from geopolitical awareness to what I would call incipient biosphere consciousness. This is in the real world. The biosphere is that little swath. It's only 30 kilometers. From the stratosphere to the ocean, 30 kilometers, where all of chemicals and the life of the planet interact to maintain the ecosystem to the Earth. It's 30 miles from the stratosphere to the oceans. We've got teenagers coming home in Pittsburgh, everywhere else, and in the developing world, and they're saying, why, why is Dad using so much water while he's shaving? We're wasting the water. Why is that little red light on on the Philips television? There's no one been in that room in four days. We're wasting the electricity. Why we got two cars sitting there doing nothing when we could car share? And the one I'm particularly fond of, bless these young teenagers, they're coming home, and at dinner, they're looking at the hamburger on the plate, and they're saying, where'd this come from? Where'd this come from? Did this come from a rainforest? Yeah, this is starting to sound familiar to some of your parents. Did they have to destroy the, tra the tree canopy in the rainforest to get four inches of topsoil, which only lasts for four years, to graze one cow? The kids know that if you destroy those trees for the soil to graze the cow, all the rare species of plant and animal life that have only lived there, they're extinct. And if the trees are raised to graze the cow on that soil, the trees aren't there to absorb CO2 from industrial global warming emissions. And if they can't absorb the CO2, the temperature of the planet goes up, and some farmer can't feed her kids because she's getting spring floods and summer droughts and wildfires. The kids are learning ecological footprint. How many, is this familiar? Yeah. It's coming informally, and thank God it's not a formal part of curriculum or the Texas school system, and others would have eliminated it probably five years ago. <laughs> this doesn't fit our scheme. It's pretty informal. The teachers are actually our new conspirators. They're doing this all over America and around the world. These kids are learning ecological footprint, that everything we do intimately affects some other human some other creature, the planet we live in, when the butterfly flaps its wings, the universe shakes and changes. This is really true. We live in one biosphere, and the kids are learning that our, in, that our own individual well-being is intimately connected to our symbiotic relationships to all the other creatures and ecosystems that make up this biosphere. When we say indivisible, one for all, one indivisible, the pledge, it's indivisible, all right. It's the biosphere that's indivisible. And all of us depend on that biosphere and all the relationships within that biosphere for our well-being. This is a revolution in consciousness. Freedom, power, biosphere consciousness. So here's the thing. Do this in Pittsburgh. We've only done one city in San, San Antonio, seventh largest city. You can do it on your own. We did an economic plan for them. They're way ahead of the country. Way ahead. They're into wind. All of, you've been reading all across southern Texas. They're into all of these new energies. Because they did it. Pittsburgh in the north, bring it to the north, bring it to the industrial north. Put this economic plan across the metropolitan region of Pittsburgh, flagship for the country, show them what's possible, bring the best scientific and engineering talent from around the world, have it done. 
Mobilize the civil community in your universities, in your high schools, in your businesses, like we're doing in Europe. There's nothing magic about Europe. You have the same potential here as any other place, but don't keep producing little siloed pilot projects. We're going to go to the abyss on having the bike path over here, and then we're going to put in the, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the special lighting from Philips over there. You have to integrate the whole thing over a period of time. Think of it as a massive construction site. Start tomorrow morning. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, my, my fingers are numb from like typing notes into. <laughs> you know, just to, just to start off with, with kind of your remarks, and um, you're, a stu you're a student of the game, right? I mean, you, you know this. You, you work with hundreds of inspirational individuals. You have an, an army of people here today. You know, how do we start tomorrow? I mean, some thoughts. Yeah, um, we just have to do it. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's simple. Um, and like I said, the thing about Pittsburgh is that when we decide we want to do something, we, we can do it. So it's a matter of just doing it. Um, uh, fortunately, you know, we can uh, be a little late to get to the game sometimes, but when we decide to do it, we, we do it. I think. Um, one of the things that um, Jeremy has done is he showed uh, all the diverse stakeholders why we need to do this. Um, I mean, he talks about jobs. I mean, he talks about the environment. He, he talks about all of the reasons, and he hits all the different sectors. And so that's how the message needs to be communicated. Because uh, what I see, because we work with a lot of millennials, uh, we work with a lot of folks from all different communities, but I see this jobs and security. Mm -hmm. And so I want to hear that first. I want to hear that first because that's so important to beginning to create a quality of life. Uh, but you know, but you hit all the different groups and you you, you push the message forward. And, and I think uh, you know the game plan was was laid out. We just need to just need to do it and be bold and be bold. Jeremy, you know, I mean, just I just said this inspirational, and I, I you know, I, I think it's amazing what you bring to the table, but. You know, one of the things that makes me think about is the, the decisions that we all have to make. I mean, how, how, how does our consciousness as a, as a society, as Pittsburghers, as individuals, how does that need to change so that we can start, ignite this third revolution here in Pittsburgh tomorrow? You just need leadership. You'll need leadership from the local business community, the civil society and government to come to the table. Let me give you an example. Uh, of the three regions now that are in play uh, in Europe. Uh, Northern industrial France is really a Rust Belt region. It was the mining region that started the first industrial revolution in France. It's from Lille to Dunkirk, Nord Pas de Calais. They decided they, they were leaders in the first industrial revolution. They lost the second industrial revolution like our Midwest. They became a Rust Belt. And they said, we're losing the kids. They're all leaving. There's no employment. We're becoming a ghost region. They said, we got to do something about it. They did it. And we joined with them. Uh, they could have joined with someone else. We joined with them, and over a year period, the Chamber of Commerce mobilized every business in the whole region, all the municipalities, the government came in, all the civil society organizations, the universities, the high schools. The whole region is mobilized and created a master plan. We brought in engineers, scientists, architects, others, but it was their plan. Mm -hmm. And they're now in the third year, and they're deploying 175 projects. I'll give you an example of just one to show you what a region can do. Two, the seven universities put together a consortium to transform all their physical plant to a third industrial revolution, data place, micropower, and hub center, but they changed the curriculum, led by Catholic University there. And Catholic University's new curriculum, they said, we don't want this old centralized factory model for education. That was for the first and second industrial revolution, top down, centralized. If you share knowledge, it's called cheating. This is weird stuff. So what they did is they eliminated all departments. Everything is team taught, interdisciplinary, across the discipline so that the young people can understand multi-perspectives and narratives so they can think more critically and mindfully and systemically. Then 
they, the teacher then becomes a facilitator and the students have to go in modules and teams during all of their pedagogy. And no grades individually, you, you're graded by your team. You either pass or you fail by the team. This is all distributed, open, transparent. You share the knowledge with each other. And they have something a little bit more, fan, a little bit more developed than our service learning. Then you have to have clinical education. All your courses have to move theory to practice and you apply what you learn with your fellow citizens in the communities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is just seven universities in this region. Then, one last thing on this. We have 200 high schools. They just, they came together in a consortium. We just received an 850 million euro credit from the EU, leverage against private equity. All six, 200 of those universities will be completely retrofitted, transformed into data centers, power plants for micro generation of energy, and transport hubs in six years. That's one region. That's not done anywhere in the world today. Why can't Pittsburgh do that or any other region? You can. What you need is just to do it. You actually need the people in this room and all your industry to get together with the government and begin to lay out a systemic map. And we would love for you to come and see how it's done in Europe, and then you can find your own way to see how you want to do it here. It can be done tomorrow. Question. For Mr. Rifkin, uh, with the advent of every new technology, there was always some kind of promise of utopia. For example, the splitting of the atom, we were going to create energy too cheap to meet. Right? Uh, you say you weren't an optimist, but I'd like you to hear you discuss uh, some problems that likely will occur on this third platform. Well, I could spend weeks, because that's when we're in these regions, we spend as much time on the potential disruptions and problems as the benefits. None of us are utopian in this. These are, this is science, engineering, business are trying to figure out how to do this with local neighbors. I'll give you a couple of examples. There are smart grids and then there are renewable energy internets. Power companies, up to now, they just wanted a smart grid where they could put advanced meters in every building, office, and factory that would generate real-time information to them on energy use that would go only back to headquarters. It's digitalized and smart. But that has nothing to do with the energy internet. The energy internet is distributed where everybody has their advanced meter and they can encrypt, they can go off-grid with their energy. And the, the reason the power companies don't want that is that little advanced meter, and you've got them some probably in your homes in Pittsburgh, it can tell you at any moment of time the actual price of the electricity on the grid. So if you control that at your factory or your home, you can develop your own apps that automatically sell your energy back to the grid when the price is high, or go off the grid if there's a disruption. So these are various choices that have to do with power, old power, and new ways of using power. That's only one of the thousands of challenges that we're facing. So, a technological optimist would say, go with this technology and everything's going to be fine. No. This is an enabling platform and it's imbued with all sorts of political issues and social issues. Mm -hmm. To that, Bill, I mean, to that point, I mean, what areas do you see as like lo areas locally that are ripe for disruption? You mean areas, you mean generic areas locally? Well, I mean, you know, what you've seen from your experience in Pittsburgh, but also, Bill, I mean, from your experience here, where, where are these areas at? Well, inclusion. You know, I think the biggest challenge that we face, you know, here, every single city in the U.S., globally, income inequality, and the challenges that come about because of that. If you look at every city in the U.S., and you ask any police chief, uh, what the state of affairs is. What they'll tell you is that we're one incident away from uh, revolution. I mean, we saw that in Ferguson, we saw that in Baltimore, um, and uh, we're seeing that across the globe. And so if we don't figure out in this next revolution and in the uh, process to get to the next revolution how to include, uh, especially here in the U.S. where, you know, we will be a majority, you know, Latino and African American country, and, and, and the Latinos and African Americans are concentrated in the cities. If we don't figure out how to deal with that issue, you know, um, then uh, this won't happen, in my opinion. So I think the opportunity is here um, because of the urgency um, 
Uh, I think, you know, and also because of technology. I mean, you look at what happened in Missouri. You had kids that were able to do something in terms of getting uh, policy and getting folks fired uh, around race issues that people weren't able to do in 10, 15, 20 years. So the way, the, the ability to organize around, you know, creating transformation around race and inclusion is, is uh, 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 you know, a real opportunity, but it's an opportunity that we really need to take advantage of if we're going to, to make that next leap. Okay, I have let a- me be, uh, Let me be specific on, on, on the regions in Europe, because I completely agree with you. In the regions that, that we're doing these plans, uh, the first communities up are where there's social housing and social cooperatives that do cooperative and social housing. They're organized. Why are they organized? Because at least in the, in the regions of Europe, the energy bill in the house is the second biggest cost outside of paying the rent. And it's subsidized rent. They have to pay for the utilities. So they're totally mobilized to have their buildings retrofitted and to install the new technologies because that's a huge cost to them. It also empowers them because if they start working together and they actually see an economic benefit that's so tangible, their second biggest cost, and they did it. Mm -hmm. Nobody did it for them. So it's a matter of understanding what you can organize around. All of these things can be organized in any community. You don't want to just do the business district, because then this is not a revolution. Right. <laughs> this is not a revolution. Sir, in the front. Yeah, so I'd like to sort of build on where you just left off and also talk about measurements. Do you think there's a need to, to move beyond GDP as a measurement for economies? Uh, and if so, is that going to lead to a, a slow move away from uh, capitalism? Or do we need to sort of have a break, have a whole new entire set of measurements? Did you read chapter one in the new I book? Did. <laughs> I did, yes. <laughs> he, he's, he's my nephew. I plant this guy in every <laughs> He's a little taller, but we're related. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, GDP is slowing for a lot of other reasons now, but there's an incipient reason that's going to get more important. GDP, when Kuznet put that together for the government, he was an economist, the government at that time during the FDR administration, they simply wanted to get some raw figures on output as they mobilized the economy getting ready for war. So everything's in GDP. If you build lots of weapons, if you're cleaning up toxic waste dumps, if you're building prisons, all of that's in the GDP, but it's negative GDP. So what happens as we're moving into this new hybrid system, it's still very young, part capitalist market, part sharing economy, the increasing amount of economic activity cannot be measured by GDP with prosumers. If one's prosuming, let's say that you're producing and sharing your music at near zero marginal cost. There's no GDP. What happened to the CDs and the records and all the technology you needed that goes with that? And then the logistics to get it to market and to sell it and to store it. Uh, same with uh, if you're not buying a television set because you're producing and sharing on the internet at near zero marginal cost. Less television, less advertising, it goes on and on. Uh, if you are producing your own renewable energy off-grid, or sharing it in local distributed networks, that's not going to be in the GDP. If you're sharing vehicles, it means less vehicles, less GDP, that's not in the GDP. Or if you're sharing in a circular economy, the children's toys are being distributed over and over again to other kids, that's not going to be much GDP there. And even the logistics costs are going to go down because of electric fuel cell vehicles at zero marginal cost. So what we're going to, I think, see is as the sharing economy moves aside a streamlined capitalist market, parent and child together, we're going to see less GDP but more quality of life because now a lot of people are going to be producing, consuming, and sharing with each other beyond the market. Not all of it. A lot of it's going to stay in the capitalist market. A lot of it's going to go to the sharing economy. So many countries have now created what they call social indicators. Uh, France has done it, the UK has done it, the EU has done it, the United Nations has done it, OECD has done it in the last five years where they're measuring not raw output but infant mortality. This gets to everybody being engaged, infant mortality, levels of education, uh, clean environments, assisted living for the elderly, more leisure time for volunteerism. Uh, all of these things actually create a quality of life and they're a much better indicator to how society is moving. Uh, but they value everyone 
and not just GDP, which usually just values the handful of institutions at the top of the scale. And a new study just came out, I guess it was this, I guess by Pew today, you may have seen it, saying the middle class now has been hollowed out and it's, uh, and uh, while there are people going to the upper class, the middle class is hollowing out at first, and, and the worst since 40 years. What we need to do now is see the existing economic system has actually moved us to an unfair, um, highly concentrated uh, 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 distribution of the wealth. This new system we're talking about is very dangerous to the powers that be. But let me say that many industries will join us across the board because they can't help themselves because they want to have the business to lay out the infrastructure and be engaged. So it isn't as if, if you think, how do you win against these big bad companies? Well, they're not all big bad. I mean, we're all part of this. You know, it's not just them. We're part of this. But the, the fact is the automobile companies, they, they will have no choice. They know we're going to car sharing networks on this platform. Does anyone think it's going to be disappear? They're going to have to adjust so they can be engaged in erecting the, the, the nets, but they're not going to sell all the cars. Mm -hmm. And we know with 3D printing that the big manufacturers are not going to be as adept at some of it because all these little five-year-olds are going to go to school in 10 years from now, and they're going to have their little a smartphone on their backpack and their little 3D printer in the next five years, 10 years, and they're going to be in school creating all sorts of new software on Skyping and global classrooms to create all sorts of new physical products, just like the millennials in this room, the parents use the software to create virtual products. And therefore, you're going to see a flattening of manufacturing. So I think unless you outlaw the technology, and that's not going to, be hap that's not going to happen, we're moving toward this, but there are many obstacles in the way with the old power interests that can stall this, and we can't afford to stall because of climate change. Right. Okay. Um, Building off talking about technology, um, you know, 20 years ago, Facebook, Google did not exist, right? Now they're some of the most um, profitable companies in the world. We also have Airbnb and Uber, right, which are called unicorns. They're billion dollar companies that haven't gone public, right? So, because of the digital world, being in the physical world to some might be less important, right? We, people work from home online, right? People were entertained in virtual world on Netflix, and Oculus Rift, things like that. So my question is, with maybe the physical world becoming less important while these tech companies, is something like transportation, you know, getting from A to B, maybe less important in the third revolution because it's not as important to get from A to B when you're just yeah. in one place. Well, that's, that's true. That's true. You want to take that question for No. no. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I thought I saw you. I thought you were maybe an Uber fan. Uh, yes. However, there's another equally interesting question. Yes, there'll be less transportation A to B, and, and uh, that's true. But there's a, there's a more interesting question. What about this Uber? Everybody's asking about who is this? Just a big global company, vertically integrated? Yeah. But I think Goldman Sachs and Google made a huge error. It's kind of an irony in putting all this money into Uber. I don't think Uber's going to make it, from our experience in, in Europe and Asia. And that is, Uber understood how to create a distributed, collaborative, not transparent because you don't know the data. It only goes to them on who the drivers are, et cetera. But they created a distributed collaborative platform for laterally scaled transportation. Then they created this traditional second industrial revolution, vertically integrated centralized company, and here's their goal. See if they, you think they can do this. They want to own, control every, every owner of every vehicle that wants to, to use that vehicle. They want to put them in their corporate uh, pyramid. Do you think that's going to happen? The owners, it's their asset. So what's happening now in Europe and Asia is owners are starting to say in the last six months since Uber went global, they're saying, what the hell do we need Uber for? Are we out of our mind? Anybody can set up GPS guidance. This is not rocket science to set up the website. And if we create a cooperative like the Germans and the Danish created electricity cooperatives, why don't we just create a cooperative, go to the banks, get low interest loans, we get paid back by <laughs> by the, the revenue that we share, and it's all internal to the cooperative and no profit going to a third party in Silicon Valley, meaning we can do it cheaper. What I'm saying to you is cooperatives are starting to form, and there are places like Blah Blah Car, it's a little like Etsy, but there are a lot of these other platforms, and I don't think Uber can make it, because 
the distributed platforms and cooperatives can do it cheaper and the revenue is shared, it stays local. And I really think this is an example where it's old thinking applied to new platforms. I mean, just, just to share that with Bill, I mean, you, you see this in Urban 20, you know, Urban Innovation 21 all the time where, you know, an entrepreneur comes up with an idea that was sparked by something else or, and then they take it to a totally different direction. I mean, can you talk to that? Yeah, I mean, we see it all the time. I think one of the challenges, and this is something that will be addressed, is that a lot of these platforms are built on public money, um, quite frankly. I mean, whether it's federal dollars, whether it's Department of Defense dollars, and um, there could be a backlash, a backlash with people basically saying, you know, this uber wealth should not be concentrated. You know, this money should be more broadly distributed. And uh, uh, that's, that's the next issue that we're gonna face. I think the other thing that we do have to, to, to realize is that while we have these platforms and we look, look at the millennials and uh, there's some incredible platforms, you have a lot of people that don't have access. To those platforms and so we still have you know this bifurcated world that can really disrupt um, uh, our progress and especially here in the states um, you know, the Gates Foundation said that you know mobile banking was going to be you know th their next big thing and that we would see you know mobile banking um, uh, progress much faster in third world countries than here in urban areas in the US and for me, that was very sad, because what you know, I know, and what I see is I see you know this you know this 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 uh, technology disconnect that uh, really uh, has the potential to uh, stymie what we're trying to do from so many different perspectives. Because if you have too many uh, folks that aren't connected, uh, that don't feel a part of the system, that don't feel a part of the sharing economy, then you know you can have anarchy. You have chaos, and so we really have to pay attention to that. And we can't make assumptions about uh, how broadly distributed uh, this technology and these platforms are. I'm going to add one more thing to that about why we're not finding a way for inclusivity and in having everyone connected. It's a problem with the way we think in America about economic activity. When President Obama uh, campaigned for the second election for the presidency, he, he gave, gave a speech in front of a small business association and he said something that went viral all over the world. He said to the small businesses, you didn't build that. You remember this? Mm -hmm. You didn't build that. All the business community went viral. Who the hell do you think you are? We didn't build that. It's the small businesses, the entrepreneurs that build America. What he was trying to say, and this is where I fault him, he needs to follow up. What he was trying to say, it's about infrastructure that benefits everyone and you have to have a social market economy. You have to have government, industry, and community all together. And what half the country has lost, they don't want the government to do anything. Half the country does not understand that you can't have an economic paradigm with just millions of Steve Jobs. As you said, a lot of that research, Steve Jobs just used all the government-funded research, and he marketed the phone. That's it. But if you ask half the country, well, who? Where do the public schools come from? The sewer <laughs> systems, the electricity lines, the road systems. Where does this all come from? They've never thought about it. I, I'm not trying to be glib. This is true. They don't know where it comes from. So the reason Europe and China and Asia and the rest of the world are moving ahead, they still have a social market economy. We did from Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Lyndon Johnson, then we gave it all up from Reagan and Thatcher to now in the UK and the US. But unless we can understand that there's a role where all of us as taxpayers create a better quality of life by laying out the infrastructure so that everyone benefits. Those are general public goods. Everyone benefits when it's a public good. Unless we understand that, we're going to be a second tier country and we're going to be in the kind of trouble you're talking. We're already in that trouble in 20 years from now. We cannot lose another generation that has this kind of mindless thinking. We really have to ratchet up the conversation. So we're up against our time limit here. I'm getting the, the big long hook from Andrew and Aurora. Um, you know, maybe in, in, in the next minute or so that we have, could, could you offer up you know, some party remarks and guidance to the audience to carry us forth? Yeah, um, we got to fight like we've never fought before. Um, here in Pittsburgh, we've done some great things, but we've gotten a little cocky. We've started to feel ourselves a little bit too much. We've got to get back to the basics. 
We have to, you know, athlete get back to the gym. You know, we're not as great as we think we are. You know, all we have to do is we have to just look at uh, the cities and the countries. Jeremy talked about and referenced. We're nowhere close to being there. Now, if we realize what we need to do, we can do anything. We've shown it before. We've shown it before. But, you know, if we don't, I mean, we're going to face some, some, some dark times. So all I can say is, you know, let's, let's stop patting ourselves on the back and let's get to work. I don't have anything to add to that. It's the best way to end the night. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all. Aurora, we're going to turn it over to you. Yeah, let's thank our speakers. Bill, Bill Jeremy, and Grant Irvin for moderating for us. Thank you very much. Um, you know, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed and you're walking away with great ideas about how we're going to apply the third industrial revolution in Pittsburgh. And if you're interested in being on one of our storytellers in February, um, send us an email, enter it on the form on the website. Hey, we want to hear your story. Awesome. Seven thanks. minutes. Thank you.